welcome everybody. Um, my name is James Hargreaves. I'm uh, from the London School of Hygiene, uh, work with Annie there, and I'm a member of the, the Strive Consortium, which I'll say a little bit about in a second. I'm also the, the director of the, the Centre for Evaluation here at the school, and have had a, a, an abiding interest for several years in uh, the association between measures of poverty or, or socioeconomic position and and HIV epidemiology and transmission. And that's one of the, the key themes of the, the STRIVE Consortium. STRIVE is a, a DFID-funded consortium uh, bringing together institutions from India, South Africa, Tanzania, um, the US, and, and us in London um, to study structural drivers of, of the HIV epidemic and, and to try and understand solutions to, to those structural drivers. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, one of those structural drivers that we're particularly interested in is, is poverty, the distribution of wealth and, and inequalities and how that interacts with HIV. And a, a key component of being able to understand and study that question is, is the measurement of poverty. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce Sabina Alkire, who's from the Department of International Development, not our esteemed funders, the Department for International Development. Um, She's from the University of Oxford, uh, Department of International Development, and she's uh, going to talk to us today about their, uh, their work on multidimensional poverty measurement and analysis, um, and particularly um, the multidimensional poverty index, um, which I understand she's been working on for, for some years. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Sabina. Um, Thank you so much. It's really delightful to be here, and I look forward as much to the half of the time that we will spend interchanging as, as to anything else. So what I'm going to do briefly is introduce the global MPI, um, show some of the analysis of the 2014 findings, and then of how it changes over time, and then also end by discussing national multidimensional property measures that are tailor-made to policy contexts. And then, in final, just show you some of the materials that are on the website, should you be interested in taking this further. The Global MPI, or Multidimensional Poverty Index, is an internationally comparable measure of acute poverty that has covered over 100 developing countries since it was launched um, in 2010 by the UNDP's Human Development Report Office and by OFI, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, and we co-designed it together. It is published by the Human Development Report Office in the HDRs, and the details of the calculations and statistics are published on OFI's website. It's been updated every year that an HDR has been published. And so I'll go a little bit into the methodology, which draws on work I've done with James Foster, um, the author of the foster greer thorbeck Index in Unidimensional Space, and, and then describe, as I mentioned, the findings. So in terms of the methodology, the MPI draws on three global surveys primarily, the demographic and health surveys for 52 countries this year, the multiple indicator cluster surveys for 34 countries, and the World Health Survey for 16 countries. And in six countries, we use special surveys that are national in character. All of the data are from 2002 uh, to 2013. And not all data sets have the same number of indicators or precisely the same definition. And all of the details of how they differ are thoroughly documented in our materials. Very happily, the comparability, both in terms of years and in terms of indicator numbers and definitions, has risen steeply simply in the four years since we launched the measure. So from those data sets, at a micro level, we derive um, the MPI using three dimensions and ten indicators. The dimensions are health, education, and living standard. They are equally weighted, just as in the Human Development Index or in the Human Poverty Index that was previously published by the UNDP office. The ten indicators are defined for the households. So you are depri deprived in nutrition if any household member is malnourished for whom we have data. You are deprived in child mortality if a child in your household has perished. You're deprived in years of schooling if no household member has completed five years of schooling. You're deprived in school attendance if a child is not attending school up to the age at which they would finish class eight. You're deprived in cooking fuel if you cook with wood, dung, or charcoal. In sanitation, 
if you don't have MDG-defined uh, standards of improved or adequate sanitation or if it is shared. Deprived in drinking water if it is not safe by MDG definitions or if you have to walk more than 30 minutes round trip to obtain it. If you do not have electricity, you are deprived. If your flooring is dirt, sand, or natural, it is deprived. And you're deprived if you don't own more than one of the following assets, radio, television, telephone, bicycle, motorcycle, or refrigerator. And if you own a car or a truck, you're not deprived in assets. The 10 indicators are weighted such that the weights are equal within each dimension, which gives a weight of one-sixth to the health and education indicators and a weight of one-eleventh, sorry, one-eighteenth to the living standard indicators. So how do we build this measure? We start with each person. Natalie is 20 years old, living in northern Cameroon with her family, her household, and she and all of her household members face the deprivations that are shaded in the boxes below. That is, they're deprived in both of the health indicators and all of the living standard indicators. In this way, we build a deprivation score for each person which identifies the indicators in which they are deprived. However, deprivation in a single indicator only might not indicate poverty. A person might be deprived in electricity but have other ways of generating good energy. They might be deprived in their water source but prepare the water so that it is safe when they drink it. They may be deprived in nutrition but it is because they prefer a very low or slim body figure or because they are uh, a fashion model. So there are different reasons that people might be deprived in a single indicator which may not actually indicate poverty. So we identify a person as poor if and only if they are deprived in a minimum of one-third of the weighted indicators at the same time. That is, all indicators in any single dimension or one health or education indicator plus three living standard indicators. In the case of Natalie, she is deprived in 67%, two-thirds of the indicators. And so she's definitely poor because she's deprived in more than one-third. Starting with each household in this manner enables us then to build a national poverty measure. And the poverty measure is the following. It is the product of the percentage of people who are poor because they are deprived in more than one-third of the indicators at the same time, multiplied by a new factor that we call intensity. And intensity is the average percentage of deprivations in which poor people are deprived. Natalie was deprived in two-thirds of them at the same time. But on average, people in Cameroon are poor in fewer. The measure is an M0 measure. It's a member of the class of the al Qaeda foster multidimensional poverty measures, um, that is basically a multidimensional extension of the Foster-Greer-Thorbeck indicators that are widely used in income poverty. So that's our approach in terms of measurement, whether we are doing the global MPI, which I'm presenting today, or whether we are doing national MPIs in which the indicators and parameters reflect the policy priorities of that country. So what did we find in 2014? In 2014, we released... Uh, estimations for 108 countries. Those 108 countries cover 5.4 billion people. Across them, 30% of the people living in those countries are poor, or 1.6 billion people, if we use 2010 population data to aggregate. However, this is simply showing the headcount ratio, and what is distinctive about the multidimensional approach is that it doesn't only give you a headline indicator, but it gives you a lot of other in information. So first of all, the MPI is a headline result, and you can see if poverty has changed or not by comparing levels of MPI over time. And poverty changes either because the percentage of people who are poor reduces or because the intensity of poverty that poor people on average experience reduces. So this gives policy makers an incentive both to lift people out of poverty but also to address the poorest of the poor and reduce their intensity. However, <clears throat> often national aggregates hide a great deal of variation, and so we do decompose the global MPI this year for 770 subnational regions, 
to provide disaggregated data. What is shown here are the figures for Nigeria and for Indonesia. And as you can see, there's quite a range in the levels of poverty within each of those two countries. For example, in Nigeria, Lagos has 2.6% of its people in poverty, whereas Bauchi has more than 89% of its people in poverty. So within the same country, there can be quite a range, and it's terribly important to disaggregate within a country. But then even more important for policy is to know how people are poor, because it's these deprivations that really can and must be eradicated in order to move and reduce poverty. So we can break down the MPI additively into each of the 10 component indicators. So these are the results for Nigeria, and we see what percentage of Nigerians are both multidimensionally poor and deprived in each of the indicators. And you see that more are deprived in child mortality than in nutrition, or that cooking fuel deprivations are the highest, followed by sanitation and electricity. You see that acid ownership is much lower in terms of deprivations than the others. That gives you some idea of areas of policy intervention. However, the tool becomes much more powerful when you combine these two kinds of analysis, that is the disaggregated analysis by region plus the disaggregation by indicator. This permits us to have a much more nuanced understanding of how the composition of poverty varies across different subnational regions. And this can be tremendously useful also for having differentiated subnational policies to confront deprivations in each of those areas. And so this, it's this ability of the MPI set of indices to offer a headline, the M0 or MPI, two intuitive indicators the press can understand, that is incidence and intensity, and then the detailed compositional information by different regions, which has motivated some to refer to the MPI as a high-resolution lens. That is a lens that gives a headline, but that can be broken down and zoomed in, and so that you can see more and more details within a country. And this is hopefully what can really inform policy at different levels in a coordinated fashion to reduce the sufferings we experience. Now, across those 108 countries, we said that 1.6 billion people were poor. Where do those people wake up in the morning? Where do they call home? Across our countries, just over half of them wake up in South Asia and 29% in Sub-Saharan Africa. So those are the regional areas that have the greatest number of multidimensionally poor people, followed by East Asia. If we ask the same question in terms of the income levels of their countries, we get an interesting story, which is that most of the MPI poor people live in middle-income countries, more than 70%, in fact, um, with 29% living in low-income countries and negligible numbers in the eight high-income countries we happen to include. But the MPI was really not designed, nor is it implemented in high-income countries. Another question we might ask is what value does this add to income poverty? Does it give the same percentage of people who are poor per country, or is it different? In this graphic, we see the percentage of people who are multidimensionally poor in the beige bars, and the percentage of people who are poor by the $1.25 a day measure in the black dots, where the $1.25 a day figures come from surveys that were fielded within three years of the MPI surveys. So what you can see is that there is a general relationship, because if you looked at the left-hand side, the numbers are very low in nearly every country. But you also see quite a bit of difference, um, quite a bit of scatter in the black dots. And so they aren't actually reporting the same percentage of people as poor in most countries. So there does seem to be a value in having both measures, because perhaps they bring out different dimensions of poverty, both of which are important. I mentioned intensity was a new factor. What does it add? On this graphic, we plot all of the countries in the same order as the last one, with the highest head count on the right, and the head count, therefore, is on the lower axis. But the vertical axis shows the average intensity of each country. So we see a rather sad story in that the countries that have the 
highest percentage of their people in poverty, Niger, Ethiopia, Somalia, Mali. In those countries, each poor person is deprived in more dimensions at the same time than in the less poor countries. So there is definitely a value in looking at the intensity and not just the headcount. The colors of the countries show the income level. And although you may not be able to pick it out, the low-income countries, interestingly, have headcount ratios of poverty ranging from 4.9% in the Kyrgyz Republic 2012 data to 89.3% in Niger, also 2012 data. So even low-income countries can have quite low numbers of poverty, although, as you see, um, they tend to have the higher rates. Again, what I've shown you are simply the national aggregates. And so just to mention very quickly, each of these countries, well, not each, but 69 of them we've broken down to subnational regions. And so there is Nigeria that I mentioned earlier with Lagos at the left-hand side and Bauchi at the right-hand side, a huge spread in terms of both headcount ratio and intensity. And we can compare countries. Cameroon similarly has quite a large spread if you look subnationally. But when we turn to Bangladesh, which has fewer regions, still the spread of those regions is much smaller. So it's quite useful, I think, to try to decompose as much as we can and where the data permit. So far, I have simply looked at levels of poverty, but really our aim is to reduce, indeed eradicate, multidimensional poverty. So how are countries doing that? We have studied this for 34 countries covering 2.5 billion people and 338 subnational regions, and we've harmonized the surveys to be rigorously comparable across uh, indicator definitions, and all of the results presented to consider the standard errors. So what information do we obtain? I'll just give you one example, which is from Nepal. So first of all, we look to see how MPI decreased from 2006 to 2011 in Nepal. Nepal reduced poverty actually in absolute terms more than any other country in our data set. And so you see the strong reduction in the headcount ratio from about 64% to about 44%, and also a minor reduction in intensity. And then we might want to know, well, how did this change by region? So the upper graphic shows the bar charts and the rates of absolute poverty reduction by region. And we can also scatter plot the regions in both periods. We might also want to know how equalizing or disequalizing the subnational reduction was. So in this graphic, the original level of MPI is on the horizontal graphic, so high MPI countries on the, on the right hand side. And the level of reduction is shown vertically. It's a race to the bottom, a race to zero poverty. So when we break Nepal across by regions, we actually see a happy story, that the poorest regions, that is those on the right-hand side, reduced poverty the fastest, nearly. And so it was a very pro-poor or an equalizing change. So it's important, again, to look at inequality within regions. And then as before, we can look at how MPI went changed. How did those 10 indicators change? And we see in Nepal, there were strong reductions in malnutrition, strong reductions in flooring, in water, and sanitation. Um, so we see the picture at a glance. And then, as before, the energy uh, can be turned onto the subnational regions, where we can see for each subnational region how they reduced poverty. And we can check the statistical significance of any apparent reductions. When we do this across the 34 countries and 300 subnational regions, we find that poverty decreased for 208 of the 338 subnational regions. Um, that is, in regions that were home to 78% of the poor people. We also find that 10 countries reduced every MPI indicator significantly, and that eight of them reduced poverty in every subnational region and that in nine countries, the poorest region reduced poverty the most. And so we are able to study across countries also the different equalizing and pro-poor trends that countries have. 
So far, I've only decomposed or broken down the poverty by region. But of course, we might want to break it down by other groups, ethnicity or caste, religious group, rural urban, uh, household composition, or other variables that the data might be representative by. So let's do that for ethnicity. In the case of Benin, the balls are each of the ethnic groups. But here we see a sad story. The axis, as before, shows initial MPI, so Pul on the right-hand side is the poorest ethnic group. As before, it is a race to the bottom. But we see that in this case, it was the least poor ethnic groups that reduced poverty the most, a disequalizing trend, perhaps creating social tensions. If we move over to Kenya, happily, we see the other story. Here, the Somali group is the poorest, and happily, they reduced MPI the fastest, so they are catching up with the other groups. Again, we might want to look at how MPI changes in comparison to $1.25 a day measures. And the reason is that if they walk in lockstep, perhaps the same policies reduce them both. So we've done this, again, for the countries where we have the ability to compare two points in time for $1.25 a day data. And we see that in some countries like Nepal, the, the rates of reduction are identical, annualized. But in the case of Rwanda, Ghana, Bolivia, the next fastest reduction in poverty, or Bangladesh, or Nigeria, or Peru, India, Cameroon, in all of these countries, the rate of reduction of multidimensional poverty was faster significantly than the rate of reduction of uh, MPI poverty. And so if we had only looked at reduction of income poverty, we might not have. So that is, in a sense, the conclusion of the findings on the global MPI. We also have decompositions for 106 countries by rural and urban regions, inequality measures for 91, and destitution measures for 49 countries. But time does not permit sharing those results. I did want to mention that the global MPI is only one of the two different types of MPIs we work on. Internationally comparable measures like the global MPI um, enable us to really look across countries and learn lessons. And such a measure might be useful in the sustainable development goals, perhaps using better data or different definitions. But alongside this, just like every country has a national income poverty measure that it uses for policy, it doesn't use the $1.25 a day measure. So increasingly, national governments are developing national multidimensional poverty indices that reflect their national definitions, seven indicators in Mexico that include income, 15 indicators in five dimensions in Colombia, a different structure in Bhutan or the Philippines. And both of these, in a sense, have different purposes, but really do push the policy envelope in different ways. And national MPIs are actively used for policy coordination, for targeting, for monitoring and evaluation. Yes, we can have a multidimensional uh, difference in difference equation, um, and also for allocation. Governments that have generated these and that are generating these have formed a network, which we have the privilege of being the secretariat at, at the moment, which includes 32 countries um, at the moment and that is rising all the time. And these include ministers, vice ministers, heads of statistics, um, and heads of states and vice presidents. And their aim is basically both to support the development of national MPIs that can enable policymakers at different levels to reduce poverty, also to promote a, a global MPI in the post-2015 or sustainable development goal context, and then also to look at data issues. So I wanted to underline that because the real motivation for doing this work is not just measurement. Measurement is motivated by the desire to really inform effective action. Um, and so we end with a quote by Jean Brez and Amartya Sen, that positive changes have often occurred and yield some liberation when the remedy of ailments has been sought actively and pursued with vigor. And it's our hope that the different kinds of multidimensional poverty indices might be used by those who are actively seeking to uh, eradicate poverty. If you are interested in what I have presented, there are some more detailed um, materials online on our website.
under MPI or multidimensional property index. There we have some case studies. Uh, we are economists in our group, but we do also go to the field and try to understand from a human-lived perspective the insights and the oversights that the global MPI has in different contexts. We also have policy briefings on different topics um, that are undergirded by academic papers. For younger people, we have infographics which try to present our measurement work in a more intuitive way without even one formula. But for many of you, what might be interesting is the data bank. So if you are interested in making a map or a PowerPoint of your country, then from the data bank, you are able to simply upload your, a particular country and do all of these graphics for it and explore it on an interactive dashboard where you can govern the indicators that show on different axes and sort of work through the database. There are certainly academic papers, but there are also Excel tables that have all of the estimations for every subnational region that we have included. So I do hope that you will use these and that that might be, in a sense, uh, we might benefit from your insights, your reflections, and your studies on them, because it's only through all of our work that uh, we will be able to advance. So with that, I thank you not only on behalf of myself, but on behalf of all of our team, and we are comprised of many young people who live in many different countries, not just in England. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm interested in the decisions about um, weighting in your index and, and kind of how you came to, to, to choose to equally weight these three dimensions. I'm sure a lot of thought goes into that, and it would just be interesting to hear about that. And I suppose I'm particularly interested um, because you, you, you include some health um, things directly in there, and just, yeah, interesting to hear the th thought process about how that uh, gets weighted alongside things in other dimensions. Sure. First of all, coming out of the human development family, there was a, a kind of naturalness of weighting H health, education, and living standards equally because there had been a debate about it uh, very actively from 91 to 93 in, in the HDI and some interesting studies um, from experts and about weights. So that we certainly built on that work. Um, but also we do robustness tests to weights, and those are published in the World Development Paper with Maria Emma Santos, the postdoc who co-authored the global MPI with me. And we found that with an equal weighting structure, if we change the weight to half of the weight on health and a quarter on education and living standards, and then half on education and a quarter on the others, and then half on living standards and a quarter on the others, then 86% uh, of the pairwise comparisons were identical across the countries. And that seemed to be reasonably robust for quite a range of plausible values across the three dimensions, where we didn't really find a literature that would weigh any one of them more than half or any one of them less than a quarter. So I think it was both the combination of weights and simplicity, because Tony Atkinson, for example, in 2002, recommended that people choose dimensions such that the weights could be roughly equal, because then policymakers can understand the measure. But Amartya Sen, recognizing that our, we will always disagree about weights, suggested that any measure that's used for policy should be robust to a range of plausible weights. And so we did both. We had equal weights across dimensions and then the robustness tests. What's interesting is that in all of the national measures published to date, they have used that same structure of equal weighting across the dimensions and usually equal or nested weighting within them. Great. Thank you. That's, yeah, very interesting. And um, it, I, it reminds me a lot of, of many debates I used to be involved in that I haven't been for a while about weighting in asset indices that are often used within some of the data sources that you, you talk about. And mm -hmm. certainly there, I think many of us came to the conclusion that that, that kind of transparency um, that comes from a simple weighting system, as well as an understanding of whether the weighting um, affects what you, you find at the end is, is really helpful in, in conveying results. 
There's a question here on the, the chat box from, uh, from Carlos. So he says, <laughs> I'd like to know how the empire measure um, is the political voice of the poor. Poverty is also a political condition where individuals or groups of people have no means to decide or participate in decision-making processes that affect the main aspects of their life. I'm interested in the idea of capacity and functions poverty. Sabina, could we ask you to respond to that? If you... Absolutely. No, I certainly agree completely with Carlos. The MPI is deeply, deeply constrained by data. So when we started, I wanted to include in it work, uh, decent work. I wanted to include in it violence, because poor people complain of violence. And I wanted to include empowerment, including political voice. Those are three sort of central dimensions of poverty, and there could be others that arise. But across all these data sets um, uh, for 100 more countries, we were only able to identify these 10 indicators in common. So therefore, we couldn't include political voice. Um, it's certainly a topic that I think should be included, but it has not been included um, also in the SDG proposals for targets uh, to the, to to that same degree. Um, but I think that the space for innovation, therefore, is at the national level, where there are some governments um, that, are ex that have not yet released their national measures, but that are exploring the inclusion of p empowerment and political voice in their measures. The only public measure which has it to date is Bhutan's gross national happiness, which is a well-being measure, not a poverty measure, but it does include governance and speaking at meetings and um, those kinds of questions in the GNH index. Great. Thanks very much. That's a, a really clear response. Um, Sabina, maybe I'll ask another one while people are, uh, are um, thinking again. So one uh, application of the sort of index that you, you've described today that I, I'm sure that people on this call might be interested in, uh, and I guess it relates a little bit to the waiting question I just asked, um, but, but, it, but it's slightly different, is obviously a, a, you know, a kind of interest of our um, group is in correlating and understanding how the association between measures of poverty and health outcomes, um, it, it, what that relationship is and how it changes over time. Um, and I could imagine that there's a bit of a challenge of doing that with your index because it has in it some components of health as part of the way that it's built up. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered if I could get you to reflect a bit on, on that, on, on using it as a, in epidemiological speak, as a as a sort of exposure measure where we're interested in how it's associated with health outcomes? That's a topic I am personally very interested in. And the reason is that um, the health in, in, in our minds was the weakest dimension when we built the MPI. We thought that child mortality would be a stock indicator, which it hasn't proved to be. And malnutrition we have only for all members of the households in a subsample in Bangladesh. And otherwise, we have it usually for women and children, sometimes only for children, and only males as subsamples, except in the World Health Survey, where we don't have children at all. So uh, the health indicators are flawed. And our hope, we, we discussed whether to bring HIV-AIDS in. We then could only bring it in at the national level because we didn't have it disaggregated by the same subnational regions. So then we decided not to do that. But it would be very, very interesting um, to be able to do the correlations. And what could be done is, in a sense, uh, to look at either the same data sets, the DHS, with the questions that they have for women and for children and those health outcomes, or to look at other data sets. Um, we have found that in terms of measuring associations, correlations are useful, but they also obscure some information. And so it depends on the structure of the variables that you are relating uh, what are the best measures to use to look at similarity and association, but we do encourage people to look outside the basket of just simple correlations because those will be distorted in something that has a very low incidence, for example. Um, uh, then it, they'll be distorted by the, the other elements of the crosstab that are not really the, the pertinent ones. And so if, if it's a dichotomous indicator, we have a redundancy measure, which is basically the percentage of people who suffer both divided by whichever of the two variables being compared have the lower incidence overall or prevalence overall. Uh, and that gives the percentage of people where there is overlap, but there could be uh, perfect overlap. So it varies from zero to one. So 
Um, there's some technical issues in looking at um, associations across variables, but I think the bottom line is that we would very much like to expand or to work on the health dimension in different ways. Both, I think the easiest one is by comparing the MPI to other indicators of health, non-communicable diseases or, or particular health conditions that we've not been able to include. Great. Thank you, Sabina. L LaRue, let me just um, read out what's in the chat box, and, and then we could ask Sabina to respond to that in the first place. So she, in the first place, she said, have you looked at all of food security? Um, and then she said that, that, that she's been working on something called a, a Lives Changed Index in their Women Empowered program. And I think there's more evidence base for the indicators that you've selected some of them for some of ours. We should rethink our indicators. That's a, <laughs> a useful outcome. A any, any thoughts about the food security question? Yeah, um, we have proposed a questionnaire um, for the Sustainable Development Goals that would provide the basis for an improved MPI. And we tried to include uh, food security questions. We looked at IFPRI and we actually included it in, in, in several versions of the pilots. We looked at the different food security modules that have come out. But our member governments really thought that, the, that they were not at necessarily getting accurate information. And so very sadly, at the moment, we don't have a, a good way of including uh, an adequate food security module in, in the household surveys, and certainly the household surveys that we use don't have it. Um, but, for example, Mexico in their national measure has one dimension of food security. So national governments put it in when it is pertinent to their conditions. So I think that that's quite a, a useful a useful dimension. It's it's not the same as malnutrition. So you can be food insecure, but you know not have a low body mass index. And so they are worth looking at separately. Great, thank you. And, and there's another comment here from from Mary Carmen. Um, so in Peru, the differences between the culture is huge and the level of poverty too. She says, how would you take culture into account when you measure poverty at country level? So that's a very good question um, because one of the difficulties of any measure, whether it's global or national, is it is trying to compare people on the same grounds. And yet indigenous groups, for example, may not have the same standards of what is a good house, or they may have additional standards like the importance of being educated in indigenous languages. So there are different approaches. In Mexico, they have the same measure, but they break it down, decompose it by indigenous groups and by non-indigenous groups. In Colombia, however, they went a step further and they built up an indigenous MPI. So they did consultative work with the communities and then identified the indicators that were in a sense missing from the national MPI uh, to build one that reflected the distinctive values of the indigenous communities. So that is a, that, that's a second possibility. Um, and then there's also a possibility of really trying to think through culture as a strength or a dimension in itself, whether it is, is dance or is festivals or is um, arts and there is one country which is exploring that in a poverty realm. And as I mentioned earlier, Bhutan also has a dimension on culture in the GNH index, which is defined in terms of cultural participation, local knowledge of plants and medicinal techniques, um, the local legends and, and stories. And so it's, it, it can be quite useful in some places to really document the trends in that. The question is whether that's a part of a poverty measure or a well-being measure, and countries have different views on where it fits, but it's clearly important. Great, and, and maybe it's a related thing. Daniel's comment here is, that, um, is about def definitions of poverty and, and whose definition counts, especially in local com communities, measures of wealth and, and destitution vary. I Absolutely. You would agree, and any yeah. thought, further thoughts on that? Yeah, um, that's a, a, a very important question because clearly, you know, you work in poverty, so your priority is the voices of the poor because you really want um, programs that meet what they articulate poverty to be. At the same time, um, the taxpayers will have to feel that this is a, a good use of their funding, and the policymakers, you need to get their ownership. And so it is often a messy process with multiple stakeholders and multiple um, fora. An interesting process was El Salvador, um, where they had – a good couple of years of consultations um, in different communities all over the country, and then they identified seven dimensions for their multidimensional poverty measure. And they included the normal ones, but they also included violence, and they also included esparcimiento, which is a place for our children to play, a, a leisure area where we can sit with each other uh, or play uh, games. And that you know, was controversial, because is that a part of poverty or not? Um, but I think really raising these issues and then having the discussions in the public space 
uh, between people with different views is one way of at least advancing the debate rather than pretending that differences in view don't exist. And even if perhaps the current decision is not one everyone is happy with, it can be revisited in the future. Great. Thank you. One problem we had with the health dimension of our index looks like something you might also have uh, an issue with, uh, given one of uh, the couple of indicators you have in the health dimension. But um, we found that people with children under five were the only ones reflected in our index. It looked like, of course, it's not on the screen anymore, but I believe one of your um, indicators was mortality of young children, um, but if the family does not have young children, then they're really absent from that dimension. Could you say something about that? Yes. Child mortality, yeah. And so basically only one of your two dimensions would apply across the board. So that was a big discussion that we had with the Statistical Advisory Committee because two indicators pertain to children, child mortality and school attendance. Um, if a family does not have children, they are identified as non-deprived in child mortality. And if they don't have a child of school age, then they're identified as non-deprived in school attendance, which would seem to make their probability of being poor to be reduced. So we, we thought about that. Um, we think that as a basic measure, this is a way forward. And in the paper that I mentioned that's been published uh, with Mariama Santos, we did a lot of statistical testing for household composition. And we did find that in poor countries, MPI poor households have more children. But we also find that that actually may be true, and so it may not be a bias. And so we, I'd encourage you to look at that bias analysis. We did it very thoroughly and very openly. And we concluded that, you know, if you look at the percentage of households without children, it's um, in the poorest countries, it's quite low of, of that bracket, and that has to do with both with family structure and with the households, and then you identify who those households are and their co compositions and their deprivations. We didn't know ex ante how big of a problem it would be, and we're quite concerned about it. I think these tests have somewhat reassured us um, that at least in certain countries that are, are, in a sense, at a different part of the demographic shift than, I think, OECD countries um, it may not be such a big issue. The UNDP Human Development Report Office did a trial measure this year for the first time where they did something different. They were very concerned about households without children, so they dropped all of them, and they replaced their data with similar data for households with children. However, doing so then no longer makes the measure representative of the population, and it also loses vital information that's real about households without children. And so we preferred to do it this way and then have supplementary studies. And the, the real reason I think that it's not a big problem is, is an unfortunate one, and that's that DHS doesn't interview a woman who is older than 49 and a man who is older than 59. And so there are, we are really blind to elder poverty throughout these surveys. When we get better data for the elderly, then clearly we will need um, a different display of indicators. But the surveys that I use really are for reproductive uh, women of reproductive age or households that have women of reproductive age. And so uh, that is one of the, the failures, in a sense, of, of the data sources that we have. Thanks, Sabine. I was going to ask a related question, actually, which um, was just sort of more generally about areas where you have missing data, which must happen regularly with these surveys. And, and I, I wondered whether you may be using some sort of imputation or, or statistical techniques for dealing with missing data. Alex says, just says, what's the relationship between MPI and, and income inequality? Well, that's a good question for you to answer. Um, we haven't done that study. It's certainly a study that needs to be done. And what we do is we do report in our tables the Gini coefficient for every country that we have, uh, but we haven't gone beyond that in terms of studying the relationship between MPI and income inequality. So, you know, a, a small research group can only do a certain set of studies, and our real, our real hope by making these numbers public is that others will take them up and run with them and, and do some of these kinds of really penetrating studies. To come back to the question on, on multiple imputation, it's a good one. We've looked into the multiple imputation techniques, and we'll do academic work on that in future. But because we rely on the joint distribution of deprivations, um, we have to be quite careful because imputation techniques are often geared towards making an average aggregate figure rather than making individual deprivation profiles 
accurate at the individual level. So this is a much more rigorous process than what is normal, normally presented in statistical methods. So what we have done is the following. If there, there are certain non-eligible households that we continue to include, for example, if a, child, a, a household has six children but they only have information on whether four of them are attending school, uh, and none of them are. I'm sorry, all of them are. So they appear to be non-deprived, but we only have da data for two-thirds of the children. We still include them. So if you have a minimum of at least two-thirds of the children, you include them. Clearly, if they're, they are deprived, even if they only have data for one child, then we include them because they are de definitely deprived no matter how many people we have. Otherwise, if, a, if we don't have those rules for determining eligibility, then if they are missing even one of the 10 indicators, we drop them from the sample. Um, the percentage of missing data is published as our bias analysis analyses uh, if any country misses more than 15% of the sample. It was quite a problem in the earliest surveys uh, that we released in 2010. It's rapidly decreasing as we uh, have replaced the surveys with, with more data. Um, so we're, we're quite pleased by that. But certainly all, we have a rigorous treatment of, of all of this in the academic work because it's, it's really quite important. And we may in future impute, but right now um, I, I would rather be conservative and very open um, and, and play on the academic front on imputations rather than publishing them in, as a policy document. Great. Sabina, anything else you'd, you'd like to leave us with? Um, this has been incredibly useful for all of us um, in the Strive group, definitely. Uh, really helpful. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah, three, three quick things. One is that our question is how is this useful in the Sustainable Development Goals framework as a complement to income poverty? Uh, what changes are feasible um, given some kind of data revolution and what should we do if there is no data revolution? <laughs> um, so those are one set of questions we're working with. The second one is we really are doing a call for research, whether it's econometric research, whether it's qualitative research, whether it's country-specific studies. I'll give two examples. In Bhutan, the national income poverty measure identifies about 12% of people as poor and the national MPI identifies about 12% of people are poor, but only 3% of people are poor in both measures. So there's a qualitative mystery. Why? You know, why are one quarter of the people who are multidimensionally poor non-income poor? And why are three quarters of the income poor not multidimensionally poor? So that's a call for people to knock on their doors and find out the story. Um, but we also need econometric work, macro and micro regressions, and we need particularly country studies looking at the policy regimes in different countries where we know how poverty reduced and how it reduced in different regions, finding natural experiments, finding different policies that may be reflected in changes in the MPI. So we are very much hoping that um, interaction with groups like STRIVE will also uh, generate further research um, in this field because it certainly is a field under development. Great. That's a very nice way to end. Thank you very much indeed, Sabina. Um, I'm sure um, if people wanted to contact Sabina, they can find you either through your website, would that be right, or, yep. or maybe through Strive. So, um, great. Thank you very much indeed to you. Thanks very much indeed to all of the participants and the questioners.